There we go. And I think Eddie's doing the slides. I think you said really, but I think it's Bob doing intro. Um, we just need the slides up, Eddie. Oh, sorry, I forgot. It doesn't come back when I we come back from triads. Yeah, that's all right. It makes you start all over. Yes. All right. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So um, welcome everyone. Uh, again, Wendy O'Sullivan, um, Superintendent for the National Park Service Chesapeake Office. Uh, we always start here um, because there, every time we do a chat, there's someone new that's joining us, new partners. Um, and so we want to make sure everyone has the same grounding. And we start with a map of the full watershed, the 40, 41 million acre watershed for the Chesapeake that runs from upstate New York down to the Virginia Tidewaters. And the National Park Service has a significant role related to the Chesapeake. There are 58 units of the National Park System within the watershed. Um, and our office um, manages several partnerships or participates in multiple partnerships that are specific to the Chesapeake. Our primary role is through what's known as Chesapeake Gateways. It's a partnership network and a community assistance program where we provide technical and financial assistance for across that full watershed for the Chesapeake Gateways and Water Trails Network. Um, we also are a primary partner in the federal multi-state partnership to restore and conserve the bay and the watershed that is led by the EPA, but has um, many, many federal agencies, all the states and DC that are in the watershed and um, dozens of nonprofit and education institutions working for the Chesapeake Bay program. And then um, the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership is a partnership that, um, that we co-convene with the Chesapeake Conservancy that's a large landscape collaborative that is striving to conserve 30% of the watershed by 2030. Um, but we're here today to um, take the next step in, in talking about and, and, and reviving and, and reinvesting in the Chesapeake Gateways program. So next slide. And so just to ground everyone, Chesapeake Gateways is a, um, again, a, a partnership network of the many, many places that are considered gateway sites. So existing parks and refuges, historic sites, museums, uh, everything from national parks to state parks to um, local uh, historic ports, that these are places that tell a piece of what makes the Chesapeake important and, and um, makes the Chesapeake special. Um, we also function at a, a, at a landscape regional scale. So you see these sort of blue um, ovals that are representing the sub watersheds. So people align by their rivers, by their local sort of landscapes. And, and you're getting a sense here of you know, the lower Susquehanna compared to the upper James. Um, and then we are moving in a direction through our new strategic plan to also begin to function and support and operate at a community scale. So the yellow dots are just representative of where gateway communities might be within those sort of sub um, regional uh, landscapes. Chesapeake Gateways is, a, um, is about places, people, stories, equity, and inclusion. And you know, we really have started to build this new strategic plan. Um, so next slide. The strategic plan has um, four strategic themes that it has been built and aligned around. Um, we worked with our gateway partners to develop these four areas. It is our focus for both our, our technical assistance, it's the focus for our strategic and cooperative relationships, and we'll be using um, these themes to then zero in our um, new competitive grants program that, um, that is coming. Each of these areas has within the strategic plan information and, and narrative that helps frame it out. It gives examples of initiatives that we're, that we're going to be working on collectively as a network to advance 
Um, it is based very purposefully in um, inclusion and equity in accessibility and um, and access. And so today we're taking we're, we're starting to sort of roll out and frame this fourth um, category here, our fourth strategic theme that is develop gateway communities as a strategic focal point. So what I'd like to do is pass it to Bob Campbell to um, sort of kick us off and, and introduce our session today. So as Wendy has highlighted, uh, one pillar of our strategic plan is to develop gateway communities as strategic focal points. That, that sounds complicated, but, but uh, at, its, at its essence, it's, it's not complicated. Uh, you know, our, our rationale for the question that we gave everybody to work with in the triads today is to tap into the fact that we sort of elementally understand what, is, what it means to try to be a Sherpa for your, your friends and your families to help them you know, find the, find the way into the, to the, the authentic experiences that they're going to enjoy that will, that will put the best foot forward for your, your community. So, so the, the concept of a gateway community, you know, has much, uh, much nuance and, and we will, will work with, with some of the nuance, but it's also an elemental in a way that hopefully that, that brief experiences as we met each other uh, lets us lets us know. Uh, gateway communities are the towns and cities that serve as the entry point to a significant public land or water resource. Uh, gateway community has the potential to serve both travelers and community men members who are engaging with the resource. Um, the NPS Chesapeake office is in the process of, of figuring out how to advance this whole community approach as a strategic objective within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We're, we're in the early stages of this, this work. We, we haven't finished uh, defining all that a Chesapeake Gateway Community Program uh, will, might ultimately encompass uh, for us with, in, in working with you all, but we are at a stage where we need to begin to engage you our partners in that in that collaborative development process. Uh, these gateway communities are your communities, after all, and and so we need your your help in in uh, in defining this this uh, objective. To aid our work, uh, we have turned to some expertise with a cooperative agreement with the Conservation Fund. The Conservation Fund is an organization that has had extensive experience working with gateway communities throughout the country. Uh, and Susan Elks, who I'll introduce in a moment, is leading this cooperative project for the Conservation Fund. And today what she's gonna be featuring is uh, a, a presentation that, that focuses on these five primary elements that are typically key to a successful gateway community. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's elemental. You, you probably, can, can yourself understand what it means to make people feel welcome, to help them understand their options so that they can have the richest experience exploring the part of the Chesapeake where, where you live. But this, this program, as we develop it, will help us to understand all of the elements in some, some nuance so that uh, we can, uh, can checklist some of the, some of the complexity of, of, of the work. Um, and, and before I hand off to Susan, I just want to want to remind you of a couple of just sort of caveats so you understand what this presentation is today as opposed to what, what it isn't. The first is, again, is to emphasize that when we use the word visitor, for example, don't get lost in that. We, we always mean, are always thinking about the beneficiaries of gateways communities being both the travelers to an area and the community members them, themselves. We can all be the, be the beneficiary of, of work that improves the quality of life within our own, own community, as well as makes, makes it a better destination for visitors that come to, come to spend time with us. Um, 
So we're, what we're really after today with these elements is, is to begin to shape a common understanding for our conversations moving forward, to, to frame our understanding so that we have a common point of reference. The list that, that Susan will share with you today, we're not presuming that that's perfect as it's presented today. You and your community partners will, will ultimately have to define the elements of success within your own communities by what's possible for you rather than uh, a list of what is required. So we're gonna share this draft document today. And then after the presentation today, we'll have it available to you as a follow-up if you, if you want to read it more carefully, begin to think about it. If you wanna provide us as any feedback, we will welcome that and we'll, we'll share it with you as a point of reference. Again, it's not a, blip, a blank flip chart, but neither is it a is it a, a, a set in stone in any way. So, so just again today is a, a chance to begin to frame the dialogue with some common points of understanding. So with that, I'll give you Susan Elks. Thanks, Bob. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for their time this afternoon and joining us and and hearing about this topic in a little bit of depth. And again, as Bob said, we have some information we can share out afterwards that that provides more depth. So anything I go through will be in those materials that will be shared. Um, my title with the Conservation Fund is Program Manager Balancing Nature and Commerce. And um, I, I have spoken with a few of you, I believe, as we've worked through this process with the, the NPS Chesapeake office on what does this mean now and moving forward, what is a Chesapeake gateway community and um, you know, a reassessment of what that means at this point in time. Uh, next slide. So really quickly to give you some basic background information. So the Conservation Fund, why we work in this space, we are a dual mission organization. Um, conservation outcomes and economic opportunity. And so our work with gateway communities falls within both sides of that dual charter, but particularly it falls within supporting community prosperity and fostering vibrant communities. Um, our land acquisition work is probably the better known of what the conservation fund does, uh, but we have various programs really that advance our overall mission that are outside of the land acquisition world. So next slide. One of those programs is Balancing Nature and Commerce. And so foundational within that program are gateway communities, their relationship with their natural, cultural, and recreation assets. And so we work to support gateway communities through the tools that you see listed here, planning, technical assistance, and training, the Balancing and Nature and Commerce program repeatedly uses those same tools to achieve the objectives in that program. We definitely want to focus on growing local leaders, fostering collaboration, and then also advancing action and implementation, again, all under that umbrella of balancing nature and commerce. Next slide. So Bob already reminded you that you're gonna see this information. So uh, don't feel like you need to write anything down because it will be provided to you. I will say that from this point forward, this information is certainly based of years of work in this area, but it's also based on specific outreach in the Chesapeake. And so what we're looking for in particular is that we have, if we've missed something or overemphasized or de-emphasized something, uh, that really speaks to this community and gateway communities in this landscape. Uh, that's, uh, we certainly wanna know that. So what is a gateway community? There are two definitions listed here. I will say the first one is a little bit like a definition you would see in the dictionary. It's kind of functional, it's not elaborate. Uh, you certainly need a defined recognizable place, a town or city to be your gateway. You need that place to serve as the entry point, as the door, as the access, such that a visitor would recognize this. And then you need that gateway to lead to a significant public land or water. That can be a national park, national forest, uh, state held lands, uh, certainly waterways, um, national seashore, um, and just as often really a collection of these resources. 
the second definition that's shown here, this comes out of a book that was authored out of the Conservation Fund in the case of Ed McMahon, and then also out of the Sonoran Institute in the case of um, Jim Howe and Luther Propes. And this was from 1997. But the definition, as with the book, they're really still very functional as to what a gateway community is. Our gateway communities are among our most cherished landscapes. Um, I would say a really quick and easy example of that that people recognize the town of Gettysburg. Uh, to Gettysburg National Military Park is a, a classic example of the community and the resource really uh, being a cherished landscape and being tied together. These are certainly areas where we're really called to carefully steward the natural and cultural resources while providing for the lives of the community members and the travelers that are called to these landscapes. Next slide. So one more slide on definitions still, um, starting with those older and sort of more textbook type of definition, how do those hold up in a specific landscape? How do they compare with what is in the Chesapeake region? And so in the recent update to the Chesapeake framework, this definition focused on sites and programming and it certainly noted that you need this, this clustering or a critical mass to rise to the level of the gateway community. And I would say in, when I look at this in, in use of the word iconic, this definition is really quickly speaking to what's cherished and what feels authentic in this landscape. And the second definition across the bottom, this is a little bit of a, a friendlier version of a gateway community definition, but also very, Chesapeake specific, it addresses community, the water as a significant public asset, and the connection from the people to the asset. It calls for the community to invest or opt in to this Chesapeake net identity. Um, so this one, it builds from the others, but it makes it a little bit friendlier and it makes it a little more specific to the Chesapeake and it also reflects input uh, that we've heard so far. So next slide, Bob went over this a little bit. One of the things I will just add here is that this is not just in the Chesapeake that people wonder who's a visitor. What do you mean when you say visitor? The, the work that I've been doing over the last year or so, I hear this conversation, whether I am um, in the West or in the Appalachian region, uh, you know, everyone wants to talk through this issue at this particular point in time, you know, travelers, um, are coming to and through gateway communities. Um, they're being called to those landscapes. They want to be there. Uh, community members, obviously they're there every day, but they are also, they're connecting with the resource. They are engaging in programming. They are joining activities out on the water. And so when I use visitor moving forward, in this presentation, this is someone that's engaging in a Chesapeake natural, cultural, recreation experience, regardless of their point of origin, whether that is the local community or um, beyond that. Next slide. So this was touched on a bit before, and I will start here. So this is not one of the five elements of a gateway community. This is an overarching piece that goes across all five of those. You can feel um, welcomed or not across all five of the elements. So it's really critical uh, to the function of a gateway community. Do visitors feel welcomed into the community? Do they feel that water-based experiences are accessible to them? Uh, do they see themselves and their ancestors in storytelling? Do they see that in marketing materials? Do they feel accommodated if they need a bench to rest on or a wider walkway to roll across or a kayak launch that they can use? And if a community is, is failing to be welcoming and failing to make destinations and programming accessible, it, it really has work to do to earn that gateway portion of this label. Um, with that said, there is no perfect community. There is no community that has endless funding. 
and I think that's understood, but the goal of being welcoming and accessible needs to be a priority in a gateway community. And there needs to be a focus on improving the status quo and, and revisiting that routinely. Next slide. So here's the official bullet list as it stands at this moment. Uh, through past work and of course the Chesapeake input over the, the past um, months, I will say we have five primary elements for a Chesapeake Gateway community. I will go through each with some additional slides. Um, with this, one of the things I wanna say on, on this particular slide is simply that there are things that are foundational and then there are things that build on that foundation. And you can see that in each of the different elements. So in a Chesapeake Gateway community, a water-based experience is foundational, but the form that that can take, the extent that that is done, um, you know, there can be boating on the water, there can be fishing from the shore, there can be biking on a trail with a great view, but the core foundational piece is a water-based experience that's accessible to the public. And so within each of these elements, you can go further and you can have a different look. So a different focus, a different scale, a different feel. Uh, one community could have an arts and culture focus, uh, perhaps a recreation focus. Uh, a community could go for more of a low key historic vibe. Uh, for a gateway community to be successful in drawing in visitors, they definitely need to be distinctive and authentic to themselves. Uh, and there's room within this five primary elements and the characteristics for a community to really to carve out their own specific course once they've got the foundational pieces um, in place. Next slide. So getting a bit further into assets and amenities. This is listed first because it is first, it is the starting point. If you don't have a public asset, uh, what I would say is your community is a different type of destination. It can certainly still be a definite uh, destination, but it's perhaps not a gateway community at that point. Um, within assets and amenities, uh, the more specific characteristic of course is public infrastructure that's land and water-based. So trails, parks, recreation options, cultural sites, historic sites, uh, public space along a waterfront, trailheads, all of this is, is public infrastructure. And then along with that, you know, you can build out related amenities. Art, of course, is an excellent one to be built out. Um, public art specifically that ties back to your community's history and programming, um, as certainly the Harriet Tubman mural in Cambridge does. You know, it's an excellent way to tie together these related amenities back to your core assets and your core programming really. And I would also say activities and events, those can come other amenities, the public loves activities and events. Some of this uh, you will, you could overlap and see where um, NPS Chesapeake office has things that they designate a gateway site, a water trail, a public water access site, those type of features would typically be considered an asset or amenity. And kind of going back to something that relates back to the framework definition under this assets and amenities, there needs to be enough to attract a visitor, enough to put a community on the map. You can't have one asset, you can't have one amenity. It doesn't, that doesn't rise to the level of a gateway community. And so one of the things that you may start to see in different communities, if there are other designations that have been applied by an organization, a trail town, a main street, a tree city, uh, those are designations that could be seen in a Chesapeake Gateway community. Next slide. Just touching on this quickly with assets and amenities. Um, some things to consider. Are these desirable for a visitor to engage with? So aesthetic beauty matters. Condition of your infrastructure matters. Convenience matters. Cost matters. Um, those are all things that visitors will consider. But in thinking about that, one of the things to keep in mind is existing condition 
matters and potential matters. And so being a gateway community is, is an ongoing process. It's not a static yes or no, but it is a process and you should always be looking for uh, potential and opportunity. And I do want to note before I leave, <laughs> thanks. I do want to note really quickly before I leave assets and amenity is just that welcoming and accessible, that overarching piece that I touched on before um, in assets and amenities, certainly there should be a focus on ADA compliance and infrastructure, but there should also be a focus on universal design, accommodating neurodiversity, removal of obstacles when called for, providing information for advanced planning. So this is where you can start to see how to be welcoming and accessible across these five elements. So now you can advance. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's probably enough talking for the moment. So I can shift to what's a great amenity. And this one, we're just going to use the chat and you can pop things in here. And some of this you may have touched on before. So if you've already got it in the chat, it's there. Um, we will be looking at all the chat um, and what's contributed. One of the things I would say here is you can contribute what you've seen in the Chesapeake, that's a great amenity. Um, but if you've seen a great amenity in any gateway community anyway, feel free to put that in the chat in terms of what are some commonalities across these type of communities. Um, this could be something that drew you to a place to start with, or it could be something that pleasantly surprised you when you got there. And everyone looks quiet so far in the chat. <laughs> I'll say when I first visited Harper's, or not first visited, but when I har visited Harper's Ferry recently, and I did that with a specific lens of thinking about a water experience rather than a history experience, I was really, really happy with their trails and the ability to walk along the river, the canal, the other river, you know, cross the river on the pedestrian bridge. Their trails are very much connected to the history in the area, but also to the water. Um, and that was something that I, I'd been to Harper's Ferry before, but I had not really considered that aspect. Ooh, outdoor dining. <laughs> there are a few clarifying questions in the chat that we're just gonna capture um, and I'll, okay. I'll make sure that you get an opportunity to answer them as we go. Yes, we are going to get to questions. We have some time allocated for that in the full group. Boat tours, outdoor trails, kayak launch. Um, yes, public restrooms. That's a fabulous one. I have to say it's a it's a basic one. Um, all right, we'll keep adding things in the chat. And again, we're going to keep track of what all lands in there so that we can um, compare it with our list. But we're going to move on to programming and interpretation. This is the second element. It's foundational, not surprisingly. Um, under this very big umbrella of programming interpretation, there are a lot of different things that you can do based on a community's history, culture, and sense of place. But the starting point is the community needs to be delivering their story, their history, culture, and personality. Uh, gateway communities need to use the appropriate voice and perspective. It's really great when sites and structures reinforce with stories, um, needs to be inclusive and not leave out people. Um, and again, going back to the welcoming and accessible, if you want someone to have a meaningful connection in your gateway community through your programming and interpretation, uh, that needs to be welcoming and accessible to people. And it needs to, to tell stories that are not limited in their audience. We can go to the next slide. One of the things I wanna note with this, and this goes across the elements in general, but you see it in programming and interpretation, delivery of programming. This can be through a National Park Visitor Center, a local visitor center. It could be through a nonprofit. The private sector could absolutely be delivering a great deal of programming through the experiences that they offer. Um, this is a collaborative lift. It's no one entity providing programming and interpretation. It is absolutely a, a partnership among different entities. <laughs> so next question for everyone here, where again, uh, pop something into the chat for us. 
again, in thinking about what you've experienced out in the gateway community, what's storytelling that you've seen that really connected with you, that was really meaningful, that felt very authentic. Um, again, this could be could have been in town at a nonprofit museum. It could have been out on the trail. Um, I particularly like really immersive type of experiences, but that's that's not every programming opportunity. Um, and you can certainly have some really wonderful experiences with traditional guided tours when they're done well, when they're done in an authentic landscape, and when there's a, a really full telling of story. So uh, one of mine, completely not in the Chesapeake uh, community, was when we were out at Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument, we had a guided tour um, by the Crow Nation of that battlefield and being in the landscape and taking this extended tour and hearing a variety of voices and perspectives across that time period. Uh, it was it was one of my favorite um, programming and interpretation experiences, I would say, of the last. Now, in COVID time, I guess it's getting to be six or seven years. <laughs> um, the Harriet Tubman Visitor Center um, that's been put into the to the chat and the the Harriet Tubman Museum. Wendy's calling out the Sandy Point State Park and the exhibit with both English and Spanish. That's one of the things that uh, you have to put more intention in front to get something in place, um, but that opens up an audience that otherwise um, would have missed that opportunity. Oh, nice. Well, we're getting lots of things in the chat on this, which is good to see. And absolutely keep sharing in that. Um, whatever you think you know about the Chesapeake region, there's always more. So, all right, but we will move on to the next slide. And so visitor service, this is one of the ones that uh, it's, it crosses the private sector, it crosses public infrastructure, um, content offered by tourism bureaus, this is absolutely an area where the visiting public will be very quick to share if there are any shortcomings whatsoever. Um, this information can range from the information that visitors need to orient themselves in the community, such as maps at your visitor center, to also lodging options, food, where are your restrooms, is there cell service and Wi-Fi. Um, and then again, with the Chesapeake focus on here, we've added in gear and equipment for maritime activities. And last but absolutely not least in this is transportation options, auto, pedestrian, bicyclist, and then connections are very critical for visitor services, bringing people into your community and allowing them to, to move through in a, a variety of ways. Next slide. So one of the things I do want to know before I leave visitor services is that the services really can be of different types and scales and sizes in communities. Um, lodging is one of the quick ways to think about this. If you're in a larger gateway community, lodging options may be multiple hotels, conference facilities, you know, everything that from that point, um, you know, down really. Uh, in a smaller community, the lodging options may be more camping, small inns, short-term rentals, and that is fine. The, there needs to be options. That's what the visitor is looking for. So some choice in the type of facility and visitors are always looking, of course, for options in the price point as well. Uh, but there is not a requirement of, you know, running that entire spectrum of um, lodging within visitor services. Next slide. So if you've been keeping track, we've covered assets and amenities, we've covered programming and interpretation, and we've covered visitor services. So each of those is something very specific that a visitor interacts with. Marketing and communications is the element addressing how a visitor knows about those assets, programming, and services. So marketing and communications for a gateway community includes branding, it spans digital and print media, site signage, how communications are conducted, and the strategy behind effective communications. And of course, a really critical part of this is keeping your information current and comprehensive, and yet still somehow making it 
easy for a visitor to access. Next slide. So really quickly from a look here, you can probably tell we're not in the Chesapeake anymore. So when done well, branding can really help uh, share content in a really cohesive way, and it can help quickly orient a visitor to where they are and what to expect. So this is from Springdale, Utah, which is the gateway to Zion National Park. And in this community, you can tell that they've absolutely put a focus on the on-site communications and imagery are very consistent and very cohesive and distinctive. Um, and this is really important these days, getting the attention of a visitor is not easy. Uh, communications, branding, marketing, it's a very crowded landscape. And so effectively doing this work uh, requires comprehensive strategy and it absolutely requires routine updates. Next slide. So one more time, we're asking in the chat, you know, what's branding or identity ownership that you've experienced in a gateway community that you went, wow, this is really nice. This was, they did this um, in a wonderful way. So Springdale is, is one example where they've pulled things together. This could be on site, but this could also be digital or print marketing materials. If you wanna share an example of that, um, uh, for myself, I have to say, when I get to a new place, I really like having a welcome kiosk with a map and destinations called out. And then I like to see that same content or similar content offered in a consistent manner when I go to those other destinations. So I can keep sort of picking through the, the web of options and, and be reminded of, of the offerings. Um, and of course, if this is all available in advance online, that's even better. <laughs> so if you have some branding you wanna share with people, go ahead and put that in there. This one may be a little bit harder to think about. Um, the Chesapeake is so diverse that I think in some ways you sort of have to drill down to the individual community to think of examples, or you have to go to perhaps like a more iconic um, location because to get up to this level, it typically takes um, a lot of effort, a lot of funding and a lot of pulling things together. I would say in general, um, uh, yeah, the Florida Keys, that kind of makes sense. Matching signage, um, when signage is consistent, uh, it's really fabulous. Um, that helps a visitor. It's also good to refresh that every so often. <laughs> If you have consistent signage, but it was done in 1979, your color scheme may be a bit, a bit off these days. The, the signs of entering and leaving the Chesapeake Bay watershed, one of the things I will say about that is every so often I come across one and I do think, here, here's where it is? Oh, okay, right. All right, that makes sense now that you've, you've pointed it out to me. Uh, the watershed is, is large. It is a very large watershed. All right, well, we will move on to kind of keep us moving in our timeline to capacity and support. So this is the last element. It's also perhaps the, the least concrete <laughs> um, element. It's the most difficult probably to assess, engage progress, uh, but it's really essential to creating a, a quality experience for a visitor. Again, whether that's community member or traveler. So if um, as part of functioning successfully as a gateway community, is there built an organizational infrastructure that is supportive? This could be public outdoor space, venues to host events, staff and volunteers to do the work, government policy that's specifically supportive. Um, that's sort of one area. A second area really, you know, with the focus on natural resource, you have to talk about how those resources are conserved, cared for, managed, and when needed, restored. 
this is definitely part of the overall picture of a gateway community. Caring for the foundational assets is ongoing work. And then of course, wrapping it all together. Are the organizations focused on natural resources collaborating with the organizations focused on arts? Are recreation interests in the community partnering with others? Is the local government coordinating with the private sector and with nonprofits, you know, all pulling toward this shared goal of functioning as a gateway community? And overall, the question is, you know, is the community really owning and investing in a Chesapeake gateway community identity? Next slide. So as I had said, capacity and support, it's a little bit hidden from obvious view at times, but there are some things that, that can be apparent. Um, fundraising as a routine part of businesses towards stewardship of resources, um, business sponsorship of public art, uh, community tree planting efforts. Uh, those are kind of examples where you could see in the community directly community capacity and support. And absolutely, this overall element, it's one that needs tending to staff change, elected officials change, um, building and maintaining community capacity and support is a, an ongoing process without a doubt. So moving down, uh, the five elements, again, just to list them one more time for you. Two things I wanna reinforce that I have mentioned, uh, gateway communities are not defined by existing conditions, potential matters, opportunity matters. Uh, they are, gateway communities are typically on a path, improvements and adjustments are part of that, uh, which of course requires the innovation, the adaptation, it calls for the commitment on the part of the community. It calls for partnership and collaboration. And again, going back to something I noted earlier, there, there is no one entity that creates and maintains a gateway community. It's a community-wide partnership dependent endeavor. You know, end of sentence, full stop. It's a partnership dependent endeavor. You, you've got to have partners to, to be successful in this area. Next slide. So those are the elements. And I'm going to give just some brief examples of examples of gateway communities, but I want to shift for just a minute to why talk about communities in this way. Why consider if your community is hitting all five elements? Why wonder if there are characteristics within an element that could be strengthened? And so when you connect natural, cultural and recreation assets to visitors with strategic direction and then purposeful implementation, you can better drive positive outcomes. Equity can be advanced, economic benefit can be expanded and distributed, education can grow knowledge to all of your visitors, resources can be better cared for, and health for people and for the resources can be improved. Um, and as part of that, um, at times communities serve as gateways, whether they do anything about it or not, being purposeful, being intentional, being strategic, you can drive positive income outcomes as opposed to sort of ending up with some negative things going on in your community that you did not want to see happen. So, yep, thank you. So just a couple of quick examples. These are not in the Chesapeake on purpose. They are in a coastal region. So Newburn, North Carolina and Beaufort, North Carolina, uh, they have a coastal location. Uh, but there are some differences between these two that help demonstrate keeping an individual sense of place and, and functioning as a gateway in the way that your community wants to. And so the map here, in case anyone is unfamiliar, these communities are along the southern coast of North Carolina. New Bern's a little bit further inland um, up on the river, uh, still has great water access. Uh, Beaufort is directly on the intercoastal waterway and it is just inland of the southern outer banks. Um, in this landscape overall, there are many destinations uh, for a visitor to consider, I would say. Next slide. Just to give you a quick look here, New Bern. As I said, great water access on the river. Um, 
They were once the state capital of North Carolina. They like to, to talk about that history. They were the birthplace of Pepsi and they like to talk about that history. They have a really strong arts um, offering across many different things in their community. Their programming has that history focus. It has that arts focus. You can see if you've paid attention to New Bern over the past several years, they're certainly being more purposefully inclusive with their storytelling. They've start to, to make that shift. Um, their visitor services, they're a mid-sized community, I would say. And so they have fairly comprehensive services, um, quite a few options. And moving on to the last two, capacity and support. New Bern has been working this angle for quite some time now. They've put effort into it. The community continues to put effort into it. And that I would say is reflected in their marketing and communications. Um, it's current, it's cohesive. They're the anchor for a broader region. Um, and you can, you can see that through their marketing and communications material. Next slide. I wanna really quickly touch on something just to give you an example of New Bern combining their very individual sense of place and history with programming, with arts, with local businesses, with options for visitors. So New Bern was settled in 1710 by Swiss and German immigrants. They named the settlement um, after the capital of Switzerland, Bern, because that's where they had come from. Bern is apparently the old Germanic word for bear. And so the bear symbol was passed along to New Bern and it's always been the city symbol and it's always been the city's mascot. They celebrated their 300th anniversary in 2010. And with that celebration, one of the things that they very purposefully did is they worked with local artists to design, create and place 50 fiberglass bears around town. And there's a tour, it's online, there's a hashtag. <laughs> It went so well in 2010 that they've continued to add to this. And I think if you get a new burn now, you can wander around the city on a weekend and find 80 or so bears. If you have kids under the age of 10, I think it's probably a fabulous way to spend a Saturday. Um, but then this bear theme, you see it repeated across New Bern. It just pops up. It just pops up all over the place. And of course, some people get to be very creative with it. You know, the new Atch. Um, axe throwing company is, um, you know, bearing the hatchet and, and all these wonderful things where they're, they're reinforcing their story um, across the way. And it is their story. It is their history. And, and they're using it to create experiences for visitors that are, are theirs, that they own in this community. Next slide. And so Beaufort, North Carolina, I pulled this one in. Beaufort is smaller. Um, it is quaint. It has small town charm. The farmer's market on Saturday morning is the, the big ticket item on Saturday. Um, obviously, it has wonderful fresh seafood. One of the things I would say that added to, to Beaufort and really sort of upped its game, um, Blackbeard's Queen Anne's Revenge shipwreck was found just out in the inlet. And then the artifacts that are coming off of that are coming to the North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort. That that asset and amenity landing in, in Beaufort, um, having been there for 300 years, but now, now, now coming to light, um, really helped bring a little something extra to Beaufort. They already had fabulous access to the water. They have really great access to the National Seashore. Um, I think Queen Anne's Revenge and the museum and the, the building next to it where you can watch um, boat building helped bring a more complete package to Beaufort. But um, next slide. It is still, Beaufort is small. If you're gonna go to Beaufort, you're not going there for uh, the play on Saturday night, um, go to New Bern for that. Um, but if you want to walk around the historic downtown and see a really intact historic downtown, if you want fresh seafood, if you want direct access to the seashore, to the water, Beaufort is your gateway community to those type of experiences. And they're not trying to be New Bern and New Bern is not trying to be Beaufort. They're each, you know, taking what they have and making um, the most of that, you know, what works for their community, what works with their infrastructure. So those are just two quick examples showing how gateway community elements can show up in a community at different scales and how that sense of place can be shared with visitors 
across different experiences. And I think Eddie, you have this slide when we come back around, but I'm happy to take comments or questions from people now and also later if someone people think of things. But I think we're gonna shift to broad question and answer. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, I grabbed a couple of our clarifying questions from the chat. Um, so we wanna make sure we circle back to those a little bit about the definition and who can be considered a gateway community. So um, the first one is one of the definitions that you shared of gateway communities said cities and towns and would a county or other type of geographical area not be considered or was that definition just an example and then the chat Wendy said there are full counties that really do associate with the Chesapeake so how would you view a county being a gateway community yeah I don't think it has to be I would say in uh, in this general answer it's how a visitor perceives it and so if a, if a county bills itself as the gateway and the visitor can perceive it in that way then generally that's possible i think in terms of the chesapeake gateway community formal definition we're not to the point of of drawing a hard line around there it is one of the issues challenges in the chesapeake watershed where is the place it's a very crowded landscape in terms of jurisdiction and so you have to think a little bit about jurisdiction you have to think a little bit about a visitor and what their perception is um, but i don't think we're we're not arrived at a final there i will say that this kind of scale and bounds is something we are still looking at thank you um, and then carol you had a question that was also looking at how things apply to city county and state parks do you want to come off of mute and ask what your question was specifically referring to Okay, well, I'm trying to um, wrap my head around. Um, is it everything, you know, <laughs> um, so I'm trying, I'm trying to um, understand how um, this money, which I don't know if it's federal money, you know, I don't know how it applies to a more local level. Um, so maybe I'll just try to take a, a crack at that. Um, so, you know, when I showed the slide that showed the gateway sites, the, the sort of regional um, sub watershed landscapes and then the gateway communities, we function at all of those levels. So individual sites that are quote Chesapeake gateway sites are, are individual places. Um, we also want and know that people think um, in a collective scale um, so like when we saw the Beaufort one, they talked, they named themselves the Crystal Coast, right? So there are places where they, they think on sort of a, a larger landscape scale and, and we acknowledge that and, and want to, you know, find ways to connect at that level as well. And then, and then at, in the Chesapeake Gateways uh, community level, we're, we're looking at communities and, and still sort of working on, uh, what what scale and scope is a community where there are multiple places and spaces and and stories and programs within that community that collectively together are representative of the chesapeake are connecting with that identity um and you know annapolis is where our office is and, it, and it's where we've started to have these you know conversations where there are multiple sites all across the Chesapeake from the Annapolis Maritime Museum to multiple multiple museums um, within Annapolis to the waterfront to city dock to programming where there's water tour providers. Um, so it's it's at a community level, it's connecting those individual both um, all those five assets and amenities and, and sort of elements that Susan walked through um, at a community scale. So our funding um, is, is in three sort of big general kind of buckets. There's technical assistance where it's people powered support. Um, then we do strategic partnerships where it's cooperative agreements and financial assistance. And now we're gonna be starting a new grants program that is a competitive 
grants program. Um, and any one of those scales that we've talked through at a site level, at a, at a large landscape level, or, or at the community level could um, qualify for, uh, for the grants, for example. Um, so, so as we're growing in these three different areas, we're going to define criteria and categories for those different um, ways that we support the gateways network. Hope that helps. Thank you. So a really, I think, specific boundary question that just popped into the chat is, is the Anacostia watershed and or Prince George's County in the boundary of this program? 100%. Great. Um, Woohoo! <laughs> yes, excellent. Uh, Vincent, you had popped into the chat a question about building capacity in non-traditional community-based organizations. Did you want to come off mute and speak a little bit more to um, what you were wondering about with that question? Yeah. Yes, thank you. I guess with a lot of the communities I work with, many will be considered limited resource or underserved or non-traditional. And so many times they have assets. But again, how do you build capacity to sustain and be competitive with more resourced or established organizations and entities? And again, as we reach out to these communities, you know, just trying to see what are the suite of opportunities that perhaps they may uh, take advantage of or benefit from. So that was the context of it. You know, I'll I'll start and I think Wendy you'll probably add to that but one of the things I think that we were very cognizant of in thinking about a Chesapeake Gateway community again is uh, there you know it's there's no floor there's a journey toward improving as a gateway community you know we don't want to call someone out because they have work left to do because almost everyone has work that they'd still like to do um, so that's one aspect of that is you know and the other is outcomes, you know, doing work where you can help produce these outcomes that the community wants to see, that the National Park Service wants to see. So that's part of, of building toward that, you know, letting communities in without, uh, you know, officially crossing some sort of line necessarily and providing technical assistance or funding assistance, um, branding assistance, things along those lines. But then also, you know, being purposeful and working toward these desired outcomes. Hi, Vince. Good to see you. Thanks for being on on with us. Um, so um, I would just add to that to say, as we've been thinking about how we take this idea of of really trying to celebrate what is authentic about the Chesapeake and and all the different levels and partners that means. Um, when we've been designing the new grants program, we've made sure that it does not require a match. So we're removing one of the big barriers to access to, you know, smaller organizations is, is making sure we don't require a funding match. Um, we also are, are really leveraging our authorities that um, enable a very wide um, eligibility pool. Um, so maybe in the past, uh, some federal grants would really limit where you have to be a certain kind of nonprofit or you have to be a, a, a government entity. Um, our authorities are much broader than that and we're going to leverage it as, as uh, to its capacity. Um, so it's going to be both the um, private, uh, private sector as well as sort of government nonprofits um, and others. And, you know, and then I think there's opportunities here. Part of what the value and intent of the Chesapeake Gateways network is, is to be a network, is to find those opportunities for cross collaboration and, you know, um, you know, sort of brother sister approach to um, partners and organizations. If there are opportunities where, you know, one uh, one part of our network can help another part of our network, that's what we're looking to um, provide as is is those connections that can help 
move organizations forward and, and fill in some of the capacity um, pieces that might still need work or, or to, to grow and, um, and to find and look for ways that the, both the technical assistance and the, and the funding assistance can support some of those um, capacity pieces that, that the, the newer, smaller, or, or less resourced organizations uh, need support around. And I think that I think that that is important. And, and one thing I think that your office can do is even in those mentor protege or partnering or teaming uh, to help craft some relationship that has more equity in those kinds of things. Because what I've found is that when you kind of team David and Goliath together. Uh, many times one system can't talk to the other and it's so many minor details where the gears come together with your office's expertise and bandwidth, uh, maybe helping some of the groups work through those alignments. I know I do a lot of work in the greater Cambridge area and I like the picture that showed up on the slide of Harriet Tubman coming off of the wall, but it's on the wall of a Harriet Tubman Educational Center and they're calling me every three weeks saying, Vince, we can't keep the lights on. So how do you have an asset that's drawing that kind of traffic downtown Cambridge and the building, the organization on the other side of the wall can't keep the lights on? It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to them. So I guess it's those kinds of things and whether that's technical training, hand-holding, education, whatever it is. Uh, and that's just one example. Uh, so I guess that's where my sensitivity and interest lies. I, I really appreciate that. And, and thanks for sharing that example. We, we are aware of, of that. Um, example and, and met the team from there. Um, our team was down with the with the MPS staff at the Harriet Tubman um, Underground Railroad National Historical Park and, and met that team. And so one of the things that we're we're thinking through and Eddie's been starting to think about is what are what are the um, technical assistance support that is out there, both from the Park Service and from you know some of our other organizations in the future as we stand up our technical assistance in our own office, we're hearing more and more that that's one of the needs that is out there related to um, sort of how you can bring support to look at, you know, the business functioning, the, the board structure, the, you yes. know, the, the nonprofit, you know, your, your philanthropic plan. Um, and, and those are spaces that we need the network to keep, you know, helping us understand. So as we're developing um, both our internal technical assistance, but then also trying to find those opportunities to bring into the network. And, and I wanna do a little shout out to Natalia for um, putting in the chat um, about an existing program with the National Park Service, the Rivers Trails and Conservation Assistance Program. They do an annual uh, open call for technical assistance. And, and it does include um, capacity um, support uh, for or conservation uh, heritage organizations. So that's a, a good resource to share across the network. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that going into some of those, those concerns and ways that we need to think about support. I'm going to transition us to Eddie to tell us where we go next. Um, and having an opportunity to talk more about gateway communities and go a little bit deeper into, you know, if, if folks are interested in what that really looks like and opportunities around that and um, what's up next uh, for the for the chat. I was still on mute. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, we have a few minutes, so we're just going to do a, a quick uh, forecast into what's next. This discussion is really just meant to get us started thinking about the Chesapeake Gateways communities as a model and as a philosophy, as a guiding, um, uh, as a guidance. So we're going to do a little deeper dive on uh, in 
December for a Chesapeake uh, Gateways 102 type session. Uh, the purpose of this one is to do that deeper dive, start looking at how to match some of the needs or identify the needs and matching them to resources that might exist. Uh, but look at what, what does Chesapeake Gateways look like for us across the Chesapeake watershed. Uh, so that session, uh, it will be repeated. So you can, uh, if you can't make one, uh, you can attend the other. And again, we'll also be recording them for future uh, access. The thing we do want to emphasize is that uh, for those of you that are on this call, there is some homework uh, uh, for that uh, next one. And it's really to start thinking about who you can reach out to utilizing our um, discussion as that uh, uh, entry point to invite other organizations or potential partners or partners that you're already working with uh, to join you in that discussion and start creating a um, feedback loop uh, within your own network of how to put some of these things into action, utilize what you're hearing from us and actioning things that are uh, you can already move on or start contemplating things that just need further discussion and how we as an office can help uh, continue to enhance those discussions for you. I also do want to do a quick recap because we've got some folks that are new to our uh, have joined us for the first time today. Uh, and we'll be doing this as we go uh, to create more of a standing library of all the resources that we're putting out through these chats so people can access them. But essentially, these network chats are really meant to help uh, uh, break down topics and, and um, uh, conversations that are uh, captured in our strategic plan so that then we can start moving towards the impact that's defined in that strategic plan. As Wendy mentioned earlier, you're at the introduction to Gateway Community session today. Uh, the next one will be on October 6th, where we will be doing a announcement of the grant program, hopefully with followed by a link to the application within a couple of days as we get um, all the uh, bells and whistles added to it. Uh, and then you'll see other announcements that'll be advertised through the chat. So if you're participating today, you'll get notices for uh, all, all the remaining uh, chat series that we have. Uh, for the ones that you may have missed, we are starting a library on our YouTube channel. Uh, here are two links uh, for the two previous ones that we held, an introduction to an agency partner uh, through Department of Transportation that we have uh, with the Volpe Center to do advising on transportation related projects. Uh, so that's a resource we're, we're hoping to expand in a relationship we're hoping to expand uh, into the future. Uh, and then um, in August, we did an overview of the strategic plan and how that's guiding our development of the new grant program that you'll uh, have access to uh, within the next couple, uh, month. And I think that's uh, you know, the close for us as far as the recap. Uh, on uh, this discussion leading into the next one on the grant announcement and then the 102 in December for the deeper dive on gateway communities. I'll turn it back to my colleagues for closing comments. Great, thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Susan, for that overview, that great overview of gateway communities. And as Eddie said, there'll be a great opportunity to dig in a little bit deeper in December. Wendy, any final thoughts for us? Um, yeah, I'll just say um, thank you to Susan. Thank you to everyone that's logged in. We're gonna be sharing around um, it. We, we have sort of a white paper that we've developed on the Chesapeake Gateway community concept. And we really are looking for feedback on that. Um, what you heard today was sort of the high level review on that. Um, the white paper goes uh, uh, deeper into each um, section. Uh, and would very much welcome feedback from the network. Um, we're looking to grow those that participate. So um, help in sort of sharing the word when, when the announcements go out for the different chats and just really um, looking forward to uh, just in a few weeks announcing our new grants program and, and just wanna give a shout out to to Eddie um, in particular for, for getting us um, so close to uh, pushing that trigger. Um, and to all of you for the feedback that we've gotten to really make sure it's grounded in equity and you know really advancing our, our strategic themes and um, look forward to sharing with you the, the main topics. Um, I see Bob has his 
Yeah, I just yep. want to, because I want to wrap up a couple other things if I possibly can. Folks are already trying to think ahead to whether they can be in or out of a program. So I caveat again, we're not rolling out a program today. We're rolling out a concept that we will explore more as the program develops beyond the point where there will be a grant availability uh, posted to you all, which will include the opportunity to advance some of the kinds of projects that it could improve the functionality of a gateway community, which is not gonna be predicated on whether you are part of a program or not. So bear with us, we're building a wall brick by brick and we're inviting you to help us lay brick by brick. And so the next up that you will hear about is gonna to start to introduce what the grant concepts are and then the availability of opportunity to apply for those competitive grants. And then we're gonna come back and cultivate another stage of development about great gateway communities that will hopefully still be in time that if you're interested in pursuing a grant in that kind of arena, there will still be an opportunity to do that. So, so tune back in, please. Thanks, Bob. And, and just to clarify, the grants that are coming are not exclusive to the gateway communities concept. Um, it is broader and meant to be all three levels that we showed. So individual sites, sort of large landscape and uh, gateway community. So um, this is just a piece of our um, bridge that we're looking to um, start to build across the network. All right. All right. Well, thank, thank you, all. you all. We'll see, hopefully we'll see you again in October and November and December for our, our slate of sessions. Have a great Tuesday evening. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.